The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled A Joint Effort for Equitable Hemophilia A Care Collaborative Solutions for Enhancing Outcomes in Diverse and Challenging Patient Populations. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash GJM860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Welcome. I'm Dr. Amy Shapiro from the Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Jean Bain, and we're presenting today a joint effort for equitable hemophilia A care. We'll start with the first module, which is the big picture, our current standards and unmet needs in hemophilia A. First, let's set the stage about the population we're discussing today. We're going to talk about the prevalence of mild, moderate, and severe hemophilia A, which is data collected from the Center for Disease Control through their national studies. They have two parts to these studies. One is the population profile, which is the light blue number. This includes all the patients cared for within HTCs. And what you can see here is that approximately 42% of the patients nationwide are severe, and a significant number are mild and moderate. The second part of the data through the CDC is what's called the registry study or community counts. That's an opt-in or opt-out. So not all of the patients in the pro population profile are represented in the registry or in community counts. Same thing. Approximately 52% of the patients in the registry are severe meaning that treatment centers either tend to approach more severe patients or patients who are more severe tend to enter the registry. However, we still have a significant number of patients with mild and moderate disease represented within the registry, which collects far more detailed information than the uh, population profile does. We can also look at the proportion of male and female persons with hemophilia A from this data. Males with hemophilia A represent a greater number of patients within the registry, again, showing that we tend to represent them more in the more detailed information we collect, whereas female patients uh, are represented only 6% of the registry we have far less female patients in the registry. And the questions we have to ask ourselves are, are they diagnosed as mild or moderate deficient patients? And are they approached for entry into the registry? In fact, for every male with hemophilia A, it's estimated there are approximately 1.5 female carriers. And approximately one third of these carriers have a low level of their factor, either factor eight or factor nine. We're specifically speaking about hemophilia A or factor eight deficiency here. So there should be at least an equal number uh, of individuals that are represented here. And as you can see, they're not. We've had substantial progress that's been achieved over the last 40 years in terms of the types of therapy that we've been able to utilize for treatment of our patients with bleeding disorders. These advancements have really accelerated over the last decade. And now we have non-factor therapies. We have a von Willebrand factor independent, uh, truly extended half-life, factor eight therapy. We have gene therapies that are licensed on the market for factor eight and nine deficiency. And so the question is, how do we utilize these new advanced therapies to approach the target population to improve their care? In the background, the standards for prophylaxis have evolved over time, as have the treatments we've actually utilized for care. In the beginning, when we first started prophylaxis, we thought that a target trough level of approximately 1% was adequate to achieve the goal we wanted in severe hemophilia A. 
This was based on the observation that individuals with moderate factor VIII deficiency experienced far less spontaneous bleeding episodes than their severe counterparts. Therefore, the 1% was targeted, and that's what we achieved, but we realized that patients still had breakthrough bleeding episodes. The current world hemophilia guidelines now recommend targeting a trough level of approximately 3 to 5% or higher. And we're going to discuss this a bit later on in the presentation about what would represent an appropriate target or an achievable target going forward. This observation or recommendation from the World Hemophilia Foundation is based on the observation that 1% to 2% trough levels don't really eliminate bleeding episodes or prevent joint disease in the population that we're caring for. And this also recognizes that individuals who have moderate hemophilia A could benefit from prophylaxis. And we're going to present some information later that actually shows what the impact of moderate deficient hemophilia is in terms of bleeding episodes and joint disease. There's growing evidence that suggests that joint bleeding episodes really only approach zero when the baseline factor VIII levels are above 12%. And actually, there's some data we're going to show you later that uh, represents even higher levels of that. This acknowledges that persons with mild hemophilia A, some of them could benefit from prophylaxis. So for example, there are individuals with levels uh, above 5% that are below what we consider the threshold for approaching zero bleeding episodes that are still experiencing bleeding and suffering some of the more uh, morbidity that's associated with that. So in summary, really, despite the advances that we've achieved, the real world data suggests that more work needs to be done. We have oftentimes delayed and inadequate care uh, due to a falling number of classical hematologists, especially in the adult world across the United States. It can be difficult for some of our adult patients with hemophilia to find someone who's quite knowledgeable about their disorder to provide the level of care that's required. We have lack of routine prophylaxis for persons with moderate or mild hemophilia. In other words, we've looked at our patients with severe disease. We've tried to institute adequate prophylaxis for them, but by doing that, we may be leaving our moderate and mild patients behind. And this includes females. And this results in a clinical burden expressed in bleeding frequency and subsequent joint disease. We have under-recognition, under-diagnosis, and non-treatment of females with hemophilia, including issues related to the female reproductive tract, specifically um, unique bleeding symptoms that, these pop that this population experiences. And we have breakthrough bleeding episodes despite what we think is adequate prophylaxis and the presence of untreated or undertreated bleeds, even in patients with severe hemophilia A. So what are our expectations for improved outcomes when we look at the population? What we would like is an increased identification and engagement of persons with mild and moderate hemophilia A, including females. We'd like to really look at the need for prophylaxis in all patients who could benefit, and we would like to decrease their burden of care. Uh, and that burden of care is not just the burden of administering therapy, but it's also the burden of treating bleeding episodes and having your life interrupted or not achieving your specific personal uh, goals for activity uh, in your life. We'd like to increase protection against bleeding for people with hemophilia A, and we'd also like to enable individuals who live with this condition to live active lives, similar to that of unaffected individuals. Uh, I think uh, we need to ask our patients, what is it you want to achieve? What goals are you not achieving due to the uh, experience of your hemophilia? Or what kinds of activities are you afraid to participate in or avoid because of your hemophilia? So our goals for today 
are to heighten the awareness of ongoing inequities in hemophilia A care across all disease subtypes, to augment understanding of the evidence that supports established and emerging agents for prophylaxis in severe and non-severe hemophilia A, to enhance ability to develop personalized treatment plans for all persons with hemophilia A, regardless of their gender or disease severity, and equip care providers with the resources to address patient education, dosing, adherence, and safety considerations going forward with these therapies. I'd now like to turn it over to Dr. Jean Bain to discuss module two. Thank you. Um, and I will be discussing, uh, I will start actually in module two uh, with discussing the current progress in severe hemoph in the treatment of severe hemophilia A and the different categories that are available for treatment. So currently uh, we can easily divide our uh, treatment options into three groups. Uh, the first group where we're really replacing the missing protein. And here we have the standard half-life, the extended half-life, and the new or more enhanced extended half-life. And then there is the group where uh, uh, we can uh, call it the non-replacement therapies, and that include uh, the factor eight mimetics, as well as rebalancing agents um, um, or inhibitors of naturally occurring anticoagulants. And then the last group is the group of uh, gene therapy, uh, where we're providing a functional gene or editing an abnormal gene in order to restore the endogenous uh, protein expression of factor eight or factor nine. Uh, and therefore uh, leading to uh, the potential for long-term treatment. Uh, there was, there's one product that has been approved for the treatment of hemophilia B in 2022 and one product for the treatment of hemophilia A in 2023. And to start with uh, uh, the progress that has been actually um, done in the class of uh, replacement uh, uh, factor VIII uh, therapy, uh, with the new uh, enhanced or uh, true extended half-life factor VIII uh, product uh, that was uh, approved in 2023. Uh, and I'm going to call it for the rest of this uh, presentation, EFA, just for the ease of, I find it so, to cook alpha. Uh, so it's, uh, they started actually by using a recombinant uh, B domain deleted factor VIII and uh, to which they added uh, FC portion as well as X10 uh, polypeptides to uh, increase its half-life. And then they added a D prime D3 uh, fragment of von Willebrand, providing the stability that usually endogenous von Willebrand uh, provides to uh, factor eight after infusion, but really making it now independent of our own endogenous or the patient's endogenous von Willebrand factor, and therefore overcoming the ceiling that the half-life of von Willebrand was imposing on the previous extended half-life products. This uh, molecule, uh, the efficacy of this molecule and the safety was actually uh, um, uh, evaluated in a phase three uh, study or extend one. As you can see here, the design of this study uh, included two arms, group A and group B. This study uh, actually enrolled uh, adolescents and adults, so uh, uh, males with uh, males and females aged above 12 years old. In group A, uh, patients that were on previous prophylaxis continued uh, 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 in with once weekly prophylaxis EFA, uh, 50 units per kilogram, and that included 133 patients. And in group B, uh, there were patients that were on previous on-demand treatment. They uh, were enrolled on demand with F50 units per kilogram. And then after 26 weeks, they uh, switched to F prophylaxis uh, uh, weekly. The primary endpoint that was captured in, the, in this study uh, was the mean ABR. Uh, but secondary endpoints were also cap captured, including intrapatient uh, comparison of the APR during the prophylaxis in group A, as well as treatment of bleeding episodes, uh, safety, pharmacokinetics, uh, changes in physical health, pain, and joint health. As you can see here, uh, the Xend1 uh, met its primary endpoint, supporting really the use of FR and severe hemophilia A for prophylaxis. Uh, uh, indeed, the mean ABR uh, was 0.71 in uh, this uh, in the prophylaxis arm or group A. 
and the um, median ABR or the most uh, frequent uh, number was uh, zero. And patients with zero bleeding episodes were actually uh, 86%. Another uh, study looking at the efficacy and safety of uh, FA in uh, kids or uh, the uh, younger than 12 years old uh, is uh, ongoing and uh, interim data has been presented at different meetings. This study again uh, uh, it did actually enroll uh, patients into two arms, arm one for the younger patients less than six years of age and arm two for uh, the patients uh, uh, aged between six and 12 years. And the regimen was once weekly F50 units per kilogram uh, prophylaxis, and they were followed for 52 weeks. The primary endpoint in this study was the inhibitor development, uh, which is defined as inhibitor greater uh, or equal to 0.6 Bethesda unit. But key secondary, secondary endpoints were also capture, captured, including PK, AVR, uh, or annualized bleeding rates, efficacy for uh, bleed treatments and perioperative management as well as safety. The extent kids uh, met its uh, endpoints uh, with no development of inhibitors uh, detected, uh, median ABR and overall ABR were actually 0 and 0 0.89 respectively. Uh, and a single dose of 50 units per kilogram was able to resolve the majority of bleeds, as well as uh, the perioperative hemostasis was rated as excellent during major surgeries and 88% of patients had zero spontaneous bleeds. As far as safety uh, with FA, there were, and that is actually from uh, the two studies, but mainly from the extend uh, one study in the adolescents and adults, uh, there were no reports of serious allergic reactions, anaphylaxis, or vascular thrombotic events. The most common adverse events that actually occurred in more than 5% of patients were headache, arthralgia, and back pain, as well as full. And um, of note, 11 patients were positive for pre-existing anti-drug antibodies, uh, but that did not really affect their uh, PK when, it, when they were compared to the antibody negative population. So, so far, uh, this, uh, these studies have uh, proved the efficacy and safety of uh, FA uh, in um, patients with hemophilia. If we sw switch gears now and um, we talk about the factor eight mimetics, there is one approved uh, factor eight mimetic that has been approved for several years now and several other in uh, development. Um, how do factor eight mimetics really compare to factor eight? If we think about like factor eight being this cofactor that uh, leads to uh, thrombin generation by bringing together the activated factor nine and um, factor 10. So bringing closer proximity activated factor 9 so that now it can activate uh, 10 and generate thrombin. Uh, in patients with uh, deficiency in factor 8, whether they have or they don't have inhibitors, as we're going to see later, uh, uh, factor 8 mimetic was developed to really uh, replace the, the role of the missing uh, factor uh, 8. And this is a bispecific antibody that has two epitopes, one binds to the activated factor nine, and one binds to activated uh, to the uh, I'm sorry factor ten, bringing them again in close proximity. So now the activated factor nine can activate factor ten. It does differentiate itself a little bit from factor eight, and the main really difference that you need to keep in mind for uh, uh, in general, and especially here in this presentation, is the fact that emicizumab has a lower affinity for its substrates and enzymes compared to factor eight. And what is driving really uh, the thrombin generation now is more the amount of activated factor nine available. But if we look at the uh, efficacy and how this molecule translates in clinical practice, the efficacy of emicizumab in treating, uh, and especially in prophylaxis in, uh, uh, in patients with hemophilia was assessed in several studies. Uh, in this slide, you can see the four studies that actually evaluated the efficacy of and safety of emicizumab uh, prophylaxis in patients with severe hemophilia at different ages, even one for uh, the adults and adolescents with uh, uh, factor eight inhibitors, 
uh, Haven 2 uh, was actually focusing on the pediatric population with factor eight inhibitors. Haven 3 looked at the uh, adolescents and adults without uh, factor eight inhibitors. And Haven 4 uh, looked also at the adults and adolescents with with or without factor eight inhibitors, but they uh, looked here at the Q4 uh, uh, weak uh, um, dosing uh, in addition uh, to the Q1 week, Q2 weeks that were uh, extensively studied in the previous studies. As you can see here, uh, the impact of emicizumab uh, prophylaxis in patients with hemophilia A as uh, published uh, uh, in this article in Blood in 2021. After following, actually, the patients that switched to emicizumab prophylaxis uh, with nearly three years follow-up, uh, there was a clear uh, lower ble bleed rates that were maintained with emicizumab prophylaxis. And after week 24, you can see that 97% uh, at least of these patients had less than uh, three bleeds uh, in each treatment interval. So emicizumab also was well tolerated over this long-term follow-up. Haven 7 uh, study came to actually uh, really focus on the, uh, the efficacy and safety of emicizumab in infants. Uh, as we're going to discuss later, uh, emicizumab really um, did answer an unmet need in this patient population. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, it Haven 7 did prove the uh, efficacy uh, across bleeding endpoints in infants with hemophilia A. But also it, it showed us that uh, the drug levels of emicizumab in infants were comparable to previous studies in adult uh, populations, something that we did not see with uh, other molecules in general, especially factor VIII replacement therapies, taking into consideration the uh, higher clearance in general in a uh, younger population. So you can see here that uh, all bleeds uh, actually, uh, and treated bleeds, but also like mainly spontaneous bleeds, uh, and joint bleeds were undetectable. And you can see that the range of age that were included in this uh, study went from nine days to 11 months and uh, 30 days. That can help us like in um, counseling our uh, families on what treatment to start. Uh, as far as after uh, the clinical trials and uh, there is ongoing uh, registry, there are ongoing registries in different countries that are capturing real world data on uh, the, uh, and especially the safety uh, of emicizumab prophylaxis. You can see here uh, some of these registries cited, uh, the UK registry, the Canadian registry, the PEDNET uh, in Europe, Canada and Israel, as well as the Athens 7 in uh, the US. And uh, the, the high number of patients that are enrolled in these registries with, uh, uh, in summary, no new safety concerns that have been reported so, uh, so far, as, uh, especially the thromboembolic events and TMA uh, or anaphylaxis uh, events, uh, there hasn't been any that were reported. In addition to emicizumab that has been approved for so many years, there is an, uh, there are new generations of uh, memetics that are being actually studied. Uh, uh, MIM-8 is probably closer or more advanced in studies than other uh, uh, of these uh, memetics. Uh, it is a novel factor eight memetic. It's also uh, given sub-Q uh, and uh, it was studied for prophylactic treatment of hemophilia A with and without inhibitors. It's fully human IgG4, and it does have unique binding episodes, epitopes, I'm sorry, to factor nine and factor 10. So on this side, in this slide, you can see uh, the reports from the multiple ascending uh, dose cohorts and the phase two trial, uh, where uh, the after loading dose on day one and day eight, uh, there were uh, ascending doses for maintenance, and uh, of note, the maintenance dose was actually divided into by weight. So for uh, lower weight or less than 60 kilograms, uh, there was an assigned uh, maintenance dose. And for higher uh, doses uh, or for higher weight, I'm sorry, or above 60 kilograms, there was another assigned uh, maintenance dose. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, there was a low number of treated bleeds beyond really cohort one, and especially in uh, uh, cohort two uh, through four, where there were no uh, uh, spontaneous bleeds. Um, cohort four 
is different from the other cohorts in, in terms that the maintenance dose was actually given every four weeks and not weekly like the other cohorts. In cohort five, uh, there were 10 spontaneous bleeds that were actually reported. However, eight of these bleeding ev uh, events occurred in one patient and two other uh, occurred in two patients before they reached their uh, steady state. And data from cohorts three and four uh, uh, support uh, uh, the weekly to monthly dosing of uh, MEM8. When when we compare the uh, the potency, if you want to say, like of this new molecule MEM8 to emicizumab, uh, you can see that there were two actually parts uh, that are that two results that are actually presented here. First of all, the in vitro data where MEM8 was uh, 15 times more potent than emicizumab uh, and um, that gives the potential for using lower doses. And that is represented in the linear curves uh, with the uh, light blue uh, emicizumab curve and the darker blue, the dark blue is actually MEM8 curve. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, out of Frontier 1, uh, thrombin generation or thrombin peak were also captured in the different cohorts. And you can see that uh, also like emicizumab uh, thrombin generation potential was uh, comparable to uh, the cohort 2 who were administered one of the lower MEM8 doses uh, during uh, Frontier 1 keeping in mind, again, that cohort three and four had higher doses. So MEM8 increased thrombin generation at much lower plasma concentrations than emicizumab, again, demonstrating its higher potency in vitro and in vivo. Um, in addition to that, the Frontier 1 uh, uh, so far has uh, shown uh, that MEM8 is safe and well tolerated with uh, most of the treatment uh, uh, adverse events being mild or moderate in severity and resolved before the end of the study. Uh, there were no trends in the frequency, type, or severity of, across all cohorts, and uh, there were no anti-MEM8 uh, antibodies that were detected and no excessive coagulation reported. Uh, even at higher doses. This is, in this slide, you can see actually the different uh, dosing or the different doses and dosing schedule that can be offered based on desired dosing uh, frequency for uh, and patient's body weight. So you can see like for uh, for patients that are heavier than 45 kilogram, there is uh, a different dosing, whether the patient goes with weekly maintenance dose, Q2 uh, weeks or monthly. And uh, and if they're uh, less than 15 kilogram weight, then there's also a different dose. Um, and uh, also of note that this is a molecule that can be uh, administered by pen. In addition to uh, MEM8, there is another molecule that is probably at earlier still phases of development, and it's uh, you, we can call it like uh, ME uh, 2.0 or the next generation of uh, ME because it is uh, engineered and optimized based on emicizumab. It's called uh, so far an XT007, and uh, it. It's, it was optimized at different levels, increasing the availability or the half-life of the product, but also improving its uh, kinetic profile in terms of optimizing its affinity uh, to uh, the uh, factor eight, factor nine, I'm sorry, and factor 10. And now we're going to uh, talk a little bit about a case of a newborn uh, male uh, diagnosed with severe factor eight uh, deficiency at birth. His parents would like to know what are the options for treatment uh, and uh, how protected the patient will be. So Dr. Shapiro, what would you recommend for this patient? Uh, or uh, do you wait until uh, the age of 12, like we used to do in the past probably? Or do you recommend to start prophylaxis as soon as possible? We recommend starting prophylaxis as soon as possible. Our uh, clinical experience has shown us that waiting until a later date uh, exposes the child to risk of bleeding, uh, which uh, can be difficult to treat, uh, uh, especially because venous access can be a problem in these young children. Uh, the other issue is that parents are often uh, very protective of a child who's untreated. They worry about their activities, everything that happens at home. 
um, every bump or fall as they begin to walk and become more mobile. Uh, and having emcizumab starting very early in life, and we've started patients uh, very close to birth, uh, gives parents uh, a feeling of increased protection and safety mm -hmm. and actually does provide uh, hemostatic coverage for children at this very early age uh, so that the risk of experiencing bleeding episodes in that first year is uh, very well decreased. Yes, I, I mean, I, I agree definitely with you. Uh, there's uh, obviously a benefit of starting prophylaxis earlier uh, and as soon as possible. We were limited before with the IV uh, need to place sports and the IV access, but the uh, um, emesizumab advantage, and as, as you uh, said, and as I already mentioned before, even seven uh, um, data has uh, proven uh, the efficacy and safety of emesizumab in this uh, age group. Uh, therefore, we're definitely um, highly recommending to start ME as soon as possible uh, for the convenience, safety, and um, efficacy. Now I'll give you the stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that great presentation and overview of these agents. We're now going to speak uh, a bit more about mild and moderate matters. Uh, and I think this is a very important topic uh, close to my heart uh, because of what, our, what we've seen our patients experience. So again, what we're speaking about are individuals whose levels are moderate between one and 5%. We know that bleeding continues in these patients once it's started longer than normal. Uh, and it happens fairly easily in these individuals so that uh, some of the activities of daily life or what we would consider just minor, very minor injuries, you know, stepping off of a curb incorrectly can precipitate a bleeding episode. Uh, patients with mild hemophilia A have levels above 5% to approximately 40%. We know that individuals whose levels are above 40%, usually uh, if a bleed is initiated, they uh, can often achieve hemostasis um, as uh, fairly close to a normal individual. But people whose levels are less than 40%, the bleeding does continue longer than normal. Uh, it's usually induced by an injury or surgery. But what we have to really think about is what is the clinical phenotype? that our patients experience. So we can't just get stuck on the level a patient has. We have to step back and think about their clinical phenotype. And these vary quite a bit among patients. Uh, some patients can present with bleeding phenotypes that overlap severe disease. Uh, it's quite interesting when this happens. We don't know all of the contributing uh, factors that uh, cause this difference in phenotype, but we have well-documented evidence that this occurs. They, uh, we know that patients who don't bleed very often, either with mild or moderate disease, experience difficulty recognizing the difference between a bleeding event or an injury that's complicated by a bleeding event. So oftentimes they present late uh, with very complicated bleeding events that require fairly intensive therapy and can suffer joint disease even with one bleeding event that has been prolonged. Uh, many of these patients tend to ignore their bleeding uh, disorder and they're unprepared uh, for a bleeding event when it occurs. They may not be well connected with their hemophilia treatment center they often can't self-infuse because of the infrequency of the need and the lack of uh, technical ability. Uh, so their care can be quite complicated. We're going to talk a bit now about what's called the DYNAMO study. And actually, we're going to cover about five studies that look at specific, uh, specifically the mild and moderate population and what they've experienced. Uh, the DYNAMO study is dynamic interplay between bleeding phenotype and baseline factor level in moderate and mild hemophilia A and B. So factor nine deficiency was included in this study 
This study is males only. Uh, there were 304 males included in this study uh, with age ranges between 12 and 55 years and a factor baseline activity that ranged between 2 to 35 percent. The median baseline activity was 12 percent. Um, the primary and secondary aims of the study were to describe the bleeding phenotype in non-severe hemophilia A and B and to assess the association between their baseline levels and the joint bleeding rate. On the first bar up above in red, what you see is that 51% of the population had experienced at least one, if not more, joint bleed in the past. And the median age at the first joint bleed was about 10 years of age. On the bottom, you can see a scatter plot of their levels and the joint, the annualized joint bleeding rate. And as you approach approximately 25%, the median ABR decreased from the levels of 2 to 5% to up to greater than 25% from 0.6 to 0.1. And this means that the baseline factor eight and nine activity level was inversely associated with the joint bleeding rate. And these are the consequences of mild and moderate uh, hemophilia from uh, a data from the CDC registry from the United States. And what we see here is uh, the curves on the right with different cohorts of individuals with different ranges of level. On the bottom is the blue from 0 to 0.9%, uh, so the severe patients which show the highest rate of loss of range of motion as they increase in age. But you can also see in the curves, the three curves above with levels from 1 to approximately 9%, there is a loss of range of motion as individuals age probably greater than what we see in the normal population. And this is likely due to the impact of their bleeding disorder uh, uh, in terms of bleeds and range of motion over time. So persons with mild and moderate hemophilia A lose joint range of motion over time compared to their unaffected population. This is a post hoc analysis of what was called the PROPEL study. This study looked at uh, patients with severe hemophilia A and used targeted PK uh, analysis to actually achieve specific trough levels in the population that uh, were treated. In this analysis, the bands from 20% and above showed the best or the most suppression of total bleeding events, spontaneous bleeds, spontaneous joint bleeds, and injury-related bleeds. Uh, to achieve these trough levels, the number uh, of infusions required was fairly high. Some patients had to infuse every day, uh, but uh, they did achieve uh, suppression of bleeding episodes when their levels, trough levels uh, were above 20%. So what is the minimum factor eight level needed to prevent joint bleeds? And uh, this is another study that speaks to this. This is from uh, Italy, from Milan, uh, a single center study looking at 270 patients. And in this study, they had patients who were greater than or equal to 16 years of age, and they included mild hemophilia A, and they only looked at on-demand treatment, so the population was uh, not uh, confused with individuals who were getting any form of prophylaxis, and none of these patients had inhibitors. And what they found was that the minimum factor eight level needed to prevent lifelong any joint bleeds and spontaneous joint bleeds was approximately 19% factor eight activity and 17.7 or 18% for all spontaneous joint bleeds, respectively. That's a, a fairly close to the PROPEL study, 
Um, but these are mild patients, not severe patients who may have experienced some joint disease and may have an increased tendency for bleeding even at a higher trough due to the damage in their specific joints. This data results from the HAVEN-6 study, which evaluated the use of emicizumab in mild and moderate hemophilia A without inhibitors. And this was an important study because it looked at providing this factor eight mimetic that gives you consistent levels over time to the mild and moderate patients uh, specifically. And this was a phase three multi-center single arm study in, of prophylaxis in patients with mild and moderate hemophilia A without inhibitors. The uh, safety endpoints are fairly uh, usual for the emicizumab study and are listed here. And the efficacy endpoints were the ABRs for treated bleeds, all bleeds, joint, target joint, and spontaneous bleeds, and they used a negative binomial regression model. They had 69 males and three females. So women were allowed in this study, and that was nice, with mild and moderate hemophilia A, because that's a population that is usually excluded from these types of studies. Uh, the interesting, one interesting thing here was that the investigator determined that these patients might warrant prophylaxis. So this wasn't a random selection of moderate and mild patients, but uh, a selection of patients that the investigators felt that prophylaxis would be uh, a good therapy for these patients. And the ages ranged from two to 71 years uh, and included 51 moderate and 21 mild patients. Patients after loading doses uh, were treated either two week, every two weeks or every four weeks uh, by the participant's choice as their maintenance dose. And what we found was that the emicizumab effectively reduced the AVRs in this population. Uh, the model-based AVRs for treated bleeds was 0.9, uh, and for treated joint bleeds uh, was 0 0.1, so very low. Uh, and this really showed safety and efficacy in the mild and moderate population as well. Uh, of interest, the majority of the treated bleeds, about 79%, were traumatic. So uh, injury bleeds can still occur, and 21% were spontaneous. So emesismas demonstrated consistent safety and was well tolerated. Uh, these are just the specific uh, safety data that was available from this study. Uh, it doesn't look uh, really any different than uh, any of the other emicizumab studies, including um, uh, severe reactions. There was one thrombotic event that was uh, uh, related to thrombosed hemorrhoids and was felt not to be related to the emicizumab uh, in it of itself. So emicizumab effectively reduced the ABRs in mild and moderate patients uh, overall, but here's a subpopulation study looking at the individuals who participated in this study who were greater than or equal to 40 years of age with and without comorbidities. And the reason this data cut was evaluated was because we know our older patients um, that or individuals as they age are at increased risk of uh, other aging events, including atherosclerotic disease, MIs, strokes, et cetera. Uh, and we want to make sure that providing this consistent level through emicizumab is safe in this population. There were only a small number of individuals who met this criteria. There were 10 uh, participants with moderate hemophilia A and six with mild in this subgroup who were over equal to or over 40 years of age. Uh, prior to study, six were being treated with factor eight prophylaxis and 10 were treated with episodic infusions. Three participants had um, HCV, one had HIV only, and two had uh, combined HCV and HIV co-infection. And that's particularly important when looking at liver disease 
uh, and liver capacity for hemostatic function in this population. The mean ABR for treated bleeds of these 16 participants uh, was 1.03, and 11 participants had zero bleeds, and there were no specific safety um, events that were noted, including uh, the ones that we're concerned about in our aging population. But again, this is a small cut, a smaller population from the study. Um, so real world experience in this population will also add to this information as time goes on. Uh, data was also collected from the patients themselves about the burden of care and the quality of life. They used a specific tool that was developed called the CATCH score. And uh, from this CATCH score, you can actually look at the treatment burden. And that score in this domain showed a trend to improvement from baseline in both the adolescent and adult populations. The other uh, CATCH domains, which include quite a few domains, were stable throughout the study as compared to baseline but treatment burden was uh, somewhat improved over time. So this is actually a patient uh, from our center. Uh, he's a 38-year-old gentleman. He has moderate factor VIII deficiency. He likes to um, ignore that he has an underlying bleeding disorder. Um, he has successfully... Uh, over many years, avoided coming to the hemophilia treatment center. But at one time, we uh, got called because he reported a severe right thigh bleed. I believe it was related to um, participation in baseball and uh, some injury he experienced during that activity. It had started about a week earlier. He had, as um, you might expect, <laughs> because of his lack of contact and avoidance of um, medical intervention, no product at home for treatment, and he doesn't know how to self-infuse. He actually has some needle phobia. Uh, he went to his local ER. He, report he didn't want to come to the treatment center. He uh, waited for three hours before the time he was uh, arrival to the time he was infused and that doesn't meet national standards either, even though the bleed had gone on for quite a while. He was infused with um, an unknown correction of a product. It was uh, not possible to figure out how they calculated a correction, and we couldn't get the number of units administered. Um, and he was sent home. He came the next day for another infusion because the pain and the swelling continued. Uh, he was given another infusion, and he was told, you're good to go. Um, but we called him because he had called us initially and uh, convinced him finally to come to the treatment center. So by the time he was seen by us, it was 13 days after the initial injury. Our evaluation and physical findings revealed a really large thigh hematoma and a knee hemarthrosis. Uh, we placed a heparin lock in him for administration of daily therapy uh, that started at the treatment center and would continue at home through follow-up to get him through uh, actual uh, treatment of this prolonged bleeding episode and then the rehabilitation that was required. So I'd like to open this up again to my colleague to discuss um, the how this highlights importance of specialized care at the treatment center uh, how you might identify patients who are not severe who would benefit from prophylaxis um, and uh, other issues related to um, the treatment of these populations. I mean, you, you did highlight like a very important uh, thing. Uh, these patients really live in denial for so long and they try to avoid coming to... Uh, to the HCC uh, or to specialized uh, um, seeking specialized care uh, for so long. I, I we have actually identified mild or moderate patients only when they needed clearance for their surgery, 
uh, and some of them, yeah, manage like probably for years uh, not to have a bleed. But then, as you said, also like they're they're carrying on like sometimes like active lifestyle. So uh, uh, there definitely there's definitely some some damage that is occurring uh, in their joints and um, and on the long run and probably at earlier compared to uh, like you have um, shown compared to the same age non-hemophilia population. Uh, but I mean, I think like in, uh, increasing awareness, uh, increasing, uh, um, uh, it's easy to capture the patients from a family, but it's like really the patients, the families that have been uh, avoiding us probably by reaching out to the community doctors more and like uh, asking them to refer them early on to the uh, hemophilia center. So we're not rushing a clearance plan before a procedure or treating after the fact uh, and dealing with long-term damage uh, sometimes. I'll give you some follow-up uh, about what we did uh, also do for this patient. We also talked about his prior bleeding events. We did a full musculoskeletal evaluation. We also did point-of-care musculoskeletal ultrasound and showed him the bleed that existed in his thigh and his knee, which I really think helps these patients with mild and moderate disease understand the need for prolonged therapy, the need for contact with their treatment center, uh, and the need for adequate rehabilitation. We ex uh, discussed the need for extended coverage for this bleeding episode because he really can't adequately go through physical therapy to retain baseline function without coverage. And we talked about his long-term treatment options, which he's still somewhat resistant to, uh, but we continue to discuss this. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Jean Bain again. Thank you. Uh, in this module, I'll be talking about uh, caring uh, for another challenging population uh, with hemophilia, uh, who are women with hemophilia. And we all are familiar with the challenges in this patient population, uh, starting with the disparities really uh, in the care of these women, um, where uh, there is need for more self-awareness and advocacy. There's also uh, very limited access to care and treatment plans. Uh, um, and and I want to say also like healthcare providers probably were less aggressive in, uh, in acknowledging the bleeding uh, symptoms of uh, these women uh, and probably dismissing them uh, for the majority, especially like those related to the repro reproductive uh, tract. And uh, uh, the lack of representation in clinical trials up till recently when we uh, saw uh, more women uh, actually included in uh, phase three clinical trials for the different molecules. Um, and this actually uh, slide you can see like uh, from two publications in uh, 2021, but also like in 2023, so very recent publications, uh, the different bleeding uh, patterns in women with hemophilia. And you can see they're simi similar to um, and may maybe similar to males with same factor levels. So like uh, males with mild to uh, moderate hemophilia with more specifics probably to the uh, bleeding to uh, in the reproductive tract and heavy menstrual bleeding and uh, postpartum uh, bleeding. Uh, and these two studies, uh, 600 females were actually uh, followed and 45% um, uh, of them, of the carriers had baseline levels less than 50%. Uh, uh, but you can see that these uh, women, in addition to their mucocutaneous bleeds, also might present with joint bleeding and also have like uh, outcome of this uh, long-term bleeding that presents with uh, iron deficiency anemia or iron deficiency in general. In the next few slides, I'll discuss like the available data that we have uh, on uh, uh, women on uh, women with hemophilia, uh, with the limitation of this data, uh, hoping uh, definitely for better quality data in the future. I'll start with this uh, um, results that were shown from the Picnic Health uh, database, where uh, you can see that. Uh, uh, the bleeding pattern of females with mild hemophilia was compared to males with uh, mild hemophilia. Uh, and um, we know the limitation of 
uh, the Picnic Health database uh, in terms of like uh, the selection or uh, the the women that are or the patients that are actually uh, studied or enrolled in this uh, database. Uh, they're approached by a third uh, party, so not really by their uh, caring uh, or healthcare providers, and therefore there is probably selection bias and who is signing up. Uh, but and it was a small number in general in this uh, in this paper. Sixty percent of the males and females did not have reported bleeding events, uh, so there were less bleeding events really to um, to uh, examine or study. But you can see that uh, they're similar somehow to uh, uh, to the uh, males with mild hemophilia A uh, with. Uh, traumatic bleeds in terms of traumatic bleeds and uh, spontaneous bleeds. Surprisingly, there were less uh, procedure related bleeds uh, in uh, females with hemophilia. Another paper that was published recently and looked at the uh, clinical characteristics, but also the cost and the bleed patterns between female hemophilia carriers and non-hemophilia carriers. Of course, this study has a little bit of like has its limitations in terms of like it looked at claims, uh, commercial claims and Medicaid claims. So taking into consideration like uh, if the claims really like uh, uh, reflected all of the uh, or the codes that were actually uh, reported were correct or not. But these claims looked at inpatient services, outpatient services, admissions, prescription drugs, uh, long-term care, and uh, they uh, they actually looked at uh, hemophilia A carriers between 0 and 89 years of age, and the control population were random, uh, was a random sample of 10,000 females uh, uh, enrollees without a diagnosis of hemophilia A or other uh, bleeding disorders. And what this study showed was that there was actually um, a decree, I mean, when across the different claims, whether commercial or Medicaid, uh, you can see that uh, hemophilia A carriers had higher uh, uh, joint uh, uh, bleeds and their joint health in general was, uh, there were more claims actually related to joint health than in non-hemoph- uh, or in control and non-hemophilia uh, A carriers. Also, uh, you can see that the uh, mean annualized bleeding rate uh, in the uh, in both uh, databases was higher in the hemophilia uh, uh, carriers when it was compared to the non-hemophilia A carriers. Uh, they also noted that heavy menstrual bleeding was more frequent in the hemophilia A carrier, but surprisingly, like the use of hormonal therapy or other drugs to address this bleeding was same between the two groups. And they did also note that there were more pregnancy claims captured in the hemophilia A carriers, uh, which probably uh, can tell us that some of these uh, carriers are uh, not diagnosed till late or till they're pregnant and therefore like there is delay in uh, care administered to this patient population. When they compared the type of bleeds, ma major and minor, uh, it was also noted that major bleeds and minor bleeds were higher and uh, there was a trend to higher bleeds in the uh, hemophilia A carriers compared to the not, to the control group. And when they looked at also like whether uh, spontaneous or traumatic bleeds also, uh, they tended to be higher, especially for spontaneous bleeds across the two databases in the hemophilia A carrier compared to uh, the control groups. Uh, as far as uh, healthcare utilization and emergency department uh, presentation and patient visits, it was also higher in the hemophilia A carriers. So that uh, is leading to uh, um, higher uh, total cost in the hemophilia A uh, uh, carrier group when it was compared to uh, the uh, control group. The third paper that I'm going to uh, present quickly here is a paper that uh, is probably older than the two other papers, uh, and it was uh, published in 2014, but it did show the impact of the factor deficiency in uh, female carriers uh, on uh, joint health. And you can see here that uh, the, uh, the curves of uh, joint health, like joint health usually I mean, it's uh, across the different ages, it gets, uh, or the range of motion gets uh, more limited with time. Uh, but when uh, when we look at uh, 
hemophilia carriers with lower levels, the uh, the limitation and range of motion is more pronounced at younger age, even in the teenage, which is uh, definitely uh, concerning and also uh, um, like highlighting the need for earlier uh, intervention and a more aggressive and optimized care in this patient population. Uh, Haven 6 uh, is a, uh, the trial that uh, looked at uh, or the role of imizumab in, in mild and moderate, but they also included uh, patients, female patients in this uh, study. And uh, here were actually the three uh, women that were uh, represented in this study. Uh, uh, patient one had moderate levels, uh, but patient two and three had actually uh, mild levels, seven and 15%. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, they, they tried to capture actually the menstrual bleeding questionnaire uh, and they saw that there was improvement uh, of this uh, um, uh, score and the bleeding uh, menstrual bleeding pattern after uh, prophylaxis. Actually, the PBAC score per month, as you can see here, has improved uh, uh, after uh, initiation of prophylaxis, but also they tried to capture the treatment burden, uh, which was also noted to be improved uh, with the emesitomab prophylaxis. And uh, two of the things that these patients noted in general were the convenience uh, or the route of administration, uh, which is the subcutaneous compared to the IV infusion that they were doing before. The frequency also of like once weekly was also a plus to the emesitomab prophylaxis in this patient population. Um, more data about uh, uh, the, the role of emesizumab uh, prophylaxis in females is uh, captured in Athens 7. Uh, also, like two of the participants that uh, uh, that have been so far uh, enrolled, like had no bleeds, whether treated or untreated, uh, and one participant had uh, one treated bleed associated with a dental procedure and one untreated associated with uh, menses, and um, did report some episodes of heavy menstrual bleeding that had to be addressed with administration of tranexamic acid, but no adverse events were uh, so far reported during the exposure to. And that was over a total of five uh, plus years. So that brings us to the uh, case discussion of a 19 year old uh, lady uh, with a mild hemophilia A that is seeking medical attention for her uh, menorrhagia. Um, um, obviously, uh, she has menorrhagia as uh, this did lead to severe iron deficiency. Her uh, menstrual uh, period lasts like uh, on average nine to nine to 10 days. She had tried DDADP in the past, but it did not control her bleeding uh, pretty well. And uh, she was not able to tolerate tranexamic acid due to some uh, GI symptoms. And hormonal therapies uh, was not an option for treatment as um, uh, we know some, uh, this is the case with a lot of our patients for cultural, religious, and also for patients that are planning to get pregnant where they have to be taken off a hormonal therapy. But of course, uh, with offering them good measures to treat their bleeds, uh, and therefore, uh, there, we need to counsel these patients definitely uh, more, but uh, uh, we need to emphasize the role of multidisciplinary care team uh, uh, by including and communicating with their woman health uh, provider. Uh, uh, but in addition, at this point with this uh, patient, I think like it's very important to discuss uh, treatment options that are available now uh, and to prevent her bleeds uh, in terms of uh, uh, prophylaxis, whether it's continuous prophylaxis with emesizumab or uh, also uh, weekly emesizumab or uh, just what we call by intermittent prophylaxis, which is the administration of uh, factor VIII replacement ther uh, therapy uh, timed at the beginning of the menstrual, pe menstrual period to control uh, the blood flow. Do you agree with that, Dr. Shapiro? Yes, I think those are very good options to discuss with this patient. And uh, with uh, this 
slide again we do uh we we want to again and again more emphasize about the role of uh a multidisciplinary approach uh to uh care for these uh, challenging population hemophilia a carriers but also the patients with mild and moderate uh hemophilia uh, a uh, uh starting with other uh, um, hematologists uh specialized nurse uh dentist that is familiar with their bleeding uh, uh disorder a social worker a pharmacist and also a genetic counselor so that we don't have to deal with uh, the uh, inheritance and all of that like at last minute in our especially pregnant ladies so in summary, we'd like to just review some take-home points. As we target higher levels for our patients with severe disease, we have to think about who we're leaving behind, specifically moderate and some mild patients who are at risk, higher risk of bleeding and associated morbidity, and we've shown you data that supports this. We need identification of important needs beyond acute bleeding in persons with non-severe hemophilia, we should look at those. What are the patient's individual goals in life? What kinds of activities do they want to participate in that they can't because of their specific factor level? Women with factor levels less than 40% are classified as having mild hemophilia. So we need to be careful with our terminology. They're not just carriers. They are women with mild hemophilia. Women have specific bleeding issues, as Dr. Jean Bain has uh, very clearly outlined, related to the reproductive tract and tracking of successful treatment uh, can be challenging in these circumstances, but needs to be attended to. Women who carry hemophilia must have their factor levels checked and appropriate care plans made by the multidisciplinary team, as again, Dr. Jean Bain has noted um, they benefit from all the services of a multidisciplinary team at a hemophilia treatment center. Uh, so we need to include them in our care model. And I thank you very much for your attention and participation in this webinar. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash GJM860. This activity is supported by educational grants from Genentech, a member of the Roche Group, and Novo Nordisk Incorporated.